Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Animal Welfare Intergroup session on the European Citizens Initiative and the Cage Age. The aim of this session is to present the status of the European Citizens Initiative, uh, uh, which collected, as you all uh, know, 1.4 million validated signatures uh, from EU sign citizens, calling for a ban on caged farming in the EU. But before we start this meeting, um, let me share some quick housekeeping rules. Uh, the webinar is streamed live on Facebook. Uh, there is no interpretation. Uh, so all those who want to intervene are invited to speak in English. Please keep yourself muted during the meeting. Uh, please add your questions uh, using the Q&A function and they will be uh, addressed at the end of the session by our moderator, Reineke Hameleer, CEO of Eurogroup for Animals. If you are an MEP and you wish to take the floor, please let us know by using the chat box or raise your hand uh, uh, if the function is available to you. This webinar will also be recorded. Uh, the video recording and presentations will be published on the Intergroup website after this session. But before we start our meeting, I would like to give the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, Francisco Guerrero, who will present the own initiative report on fish welfare in the Fisheries Committee. And Francisco, uh, the floor is yours for uh, five to seven minutes. Thank you, Anya. Thanks for everyone to, that are watching. I'll be concise and brief. So we are uh, working on the PESH committee to, to have uh, own initiative report, uh, so-called IMI, on farmed fish welfare uh, to be initiated. Uh, and this would uh, focus on main issues associated with the European agriculture and fish welfare and would start the process uh, much required uh, for detailed legislation, setting out minimum standards for the protection of farmed fish uh, to be introduced. Uh, we, all, we all know that due to the scientific data uh, and uh, also some, some legislation that uh, these animals, these uh, fish uh, are sentient beings. So, uh, we are talking about uh, animals that can, are capable of feeling pain, fear, and have psychological stress. And uh, to give you an example, in the European Union in 2015, it's estimated that 500 million to 1.7 billion of these animals were killed for human consumption. Uh, and this comprises a lot of range of, of species, obviously. And so um, there's a lot of evidence that these practices need to be better regulated and we need better legislation. Uh, there are some uh, legislation, but they are sparse and they are divided in several uh, directives and regulations. And uh, also we, we have to consider that there's a new EMFF, so an, a new fund for fisheries that is being now, uh, it, it's like the final approval, but it will be approved and is pushing for aquaculture sector. So we need to have this uh, in report so we can better uh, analyze the, the legislation around fish welfare. This will also establish some guidelines to the, to the industry and uh, it will unify, at least it will give a, a path to the commission to unify some legislation. Uh, we also noticed that uh, because there's there's a, a sparse legislation at this area um, that the enforcement obviously is not effective so uh, we have to have a, a focus point and this in and uh, we think that could help give that that starts to the commission and so um, uh, to give you also uh, another example we have this this type of of, of legislation to other animals namely pigs, uh, ants, calves, and, but we don't have it for fish. So we really need to push this um, and to have it this, this in the opinion at PESH committee. And we already wrote a letter to the previous presidents. We are waiting um, the, our request to be analyzed by the, the, the coordinators of PESH. So we continue this effort. Uh, we also uh, have to uh, to consider that 
Eurobarometer uh, stated that 94% of uh, citizens, European citizens, want uh, more uh, animal welfare protection. And so this also relates to fish. So we, we should continue to work at this level. And so, uh, as I stated, we wrote to the, to the president of uh, the PESH committee. We are working with our different groups to try to, to, to make that this INI is one of the chosen one of the list that is now currently being debated. And so we do think this is uh, premium and we really have to start this INI report, not only because of the, the EMFF that is uh, uh, a couple of weeks to, to be approved and that will take enforcement in a couple of months, but also due to the several other legislation that are sparse and uh, not not combining this, this new scientific data that shows that these animals need better protection and also the industry needs to be better regulated and the controls need to be more effective. Um, so for now, this is our, our, our work at this area to try to, to establish the minimum standards for farmed fish. Uh, and we are uh, also trying to, to reach out to our fellow MEPs of the PESH committee so they can uh, talk to their coordinators so this INI report could be approved and that we all could work together to, to guarantee that we have better animal uh, policies regarding fish farms uh, that will be a reality in the, in the upcoming months. So I think the European Parliament should be and PESH committee should be on the forefront of this uh, legislation. This is my presentation and I'm obviously uh, available to any questions that might occur. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Francisco, for your presentation and for addressing this uh, important topic. I don't see any questions for you uh, at this moment. Uh, so we will continue to the next point of the agenda. Um, uh, but I'm sure, Francisco, that uh, when MEPs have questions later on, they will contact you. Um, the next on our point on our agenda is the status of the working group on cage-free farming. And I would like to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Eleonora Evi. Uh, Eleonora is one of the intergroup vice presidents and together we co-chair the cage-free farming working group. Eleonora, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anya. Thank you very much. I am very grateful uh, to the Animal Welfare Intergroup for giving me the opportunity to give a short update on the activity of the Cage Free Working Group, which I have the pleasure to co-chair with you, my dear colleague, Anya. I would like to uh, give you all a brief overview of what uh, uh, and where we stand with the ECI and our activities. Olga Kiku from Compassion in World Farming, who run the Secretariat of the Working Group, will then go more into the details uh, with her presentation. This working group was launched during the last legislative term to provide support to the ECI and the KGH and coordinate the parliamentary activity related to the ECI. Our ultimate goal fully aligns with, the, uh, with that of the uh, and the KGH European Citizen Initiative. We want the EU to phase out the use of cages for all farmed animals. Every year, over 300 million animals in the EU still spend all or a significant part of their lives imprisoned in cages. Egg-laying hens and rabbits raised for meat are kept in space about the area of an A4 sheet of paper. And animals, all sows, spend half of every year inside cages in which they cannot even turn around. This causes tremendous suffering as these sentient beings cannot perform most of their natural behaviors. We cannot allow this cruelty to continue. Citizens are even more concerned about animal welfare and increasingly opposed to industrial farming and intensive farming practices like caged farming, which destroy natural habitats and pose a serious risk of emergence of new pandemics. This was confirmed by the outstanding result achieved by the NKJ ECI, which last year passed the threshold of 1 million signatures, qualifying as one of the very few successful ECIs since the instrument was established. 
If last year we witnessed such an amazing result, this year we needed to make sure that this is translated into concrete change. Indeed, the ECI and the KJG is now moving into the last stages of its process. After the submission of nearly 1.4 million authenticated signatures to the Commission, and the KJG will now be discussed by the European Parliament, first with a public hearing and then with a plenary debate, which we hope will be followed by the adoption of an ambitious resolution that backs the ECI's demands. These appointments are therefore extremely crucial. Depending on their outcome, they can either build momentum for a legislative action by the Commission or represent a major setback. It is therefore important that we remain engaged and mobilize ourselves and our colleagues to make sure that the Parliament's response to the ECI do not let down the many citizens who have supported this initiative and the millions of animals condemned to spend their entire life trapped in cages. Mm -hmm. The public hearing will now take place on April 15 and will be jointly organized by the Petty and Agri Committees. It is crucial to ensure that cage-free alliance within these two committees speak at this hearing in favor of the ECI. Therefore, I would like to invite colleagues from the intergroup to secure speaking time within their respective group for this hearing in order to make sure that the voice of the animals and that of the 1.4 million citizens who are behind these ECIs is heard loud and clear. Last but not least, the Farm to Fork strategy in the report presents an opportunity for MEPs to support the transition to cage-free farming in Europe and score a big win for our common cause. Together with many members of the cage-free uh, working group, we have jointly tabled a number of amendments on the issue of caged farming, calling to the Commission to come forward with a legislative proposal to ban the use of cages uh, in EU animal farming and support a transition to cage-free uh, systems. Here as well, I would like to invite everyone to support these amendments and encourage colleagues of the intergroup to reach out to their group's shadows in the, on the report in order to express their support and increase the, sh the changes that these amendments pass uh, uh, in the final report. As you uh, see, the next months uh, will be crucial for the success of the ECI. Together with the Secretariat of the Working Group, we have planned a number of activities and initiatives, from letters to the Commission, to email actions, in order to keep up the momentum and enlarge even further the support for these initiatives within the Parliament. Before the end of the month, we will have the next meeting of the cage-free working group to finalize these activities ahead of these important appointments and discuss about the next steps. I am therefore confident that if we remain committed to work together in the coming days and months, we can contribute to bring about the long-awaited change that our citizens expect and demand and finally relegate cages to history textbooks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Eleonora. I would also like to thank all the other MEPs in the case-free uh, farming working group uh, and all colleagues in the intergroup uh, who have at many occasions taken uh, action against caged farming in the EU. And it is clear that um, when animals are concentrated in large numbers in confined spaces, they do not experience a, a life worth living. There is a great deal of scientific evidence that farmed animals suffer in cages. Uh, and yet every year in the EU, over 300 million animals still spend part of their lives, of their whole lives in cages, pens or stalls. Uh, and, and even in, in the so-called enriched cages, laying hands have only the, the space of, of about one A4 sheet of paper, which does not allow them uh, to perform basic needs such as dust bathing or, or wing flapping. And, and rabbits raised for meat have similar tiny space and some are even unable to, to stand up or with their uh, uh, 
uh, ears up or, or stretch. And almost all sows spell, spend half of every year inside crates which, uh, in which they cannot even turn around. Um, and yet uh, alternatives exist, so we need action. Uh, uh, as these alternatives are already there. So, dear attendees, uh, let me now give the floor and a warm welcome to uh, our next speaker, Olga Kiku, uh, Head of Compassion in World Farming uh, uh, EU and one of the seven European citizens uh, in the committee representing the End of the Cage Age uh, European Citizens Initiative. Olga will present the political developments and the next steps in the initiative today. Dear Olga, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, really glad to be here today. I will uh, uh, switch to uh, presenter. I will share my presentation. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if you can see the presentation. Yes, very good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it in a view mode? Because I'm not. Yeah. yeah, it's a view mode. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so here we are. We start with um, we started a few years ago, actually, with the CI and the End the Cage Age uh, European Citizens Initiative um, basically calls on the European Commission uh, to present legislation to prohibit the use of cages for a number of animal uh, species who are farmed in cages. And all, as uh, um, the MEP said, um, already we have uh, over 300 million animals uh, who spend their lives in cages every year. The, the cages have um, tremendous, caused tremendous suffering to animals. And I'm not going to go into this now. My colleague who will follow my presentation will actually talk about the suffering involved. I am going to the ECI and the actions that took place uh, over the course of a year. Um, uh, citizens across Europe were enthusiastic about the ECI and supported the ECI. And you can see here uh, some of the actions that uh, took place uh, um, in the in the months that uh, the ECI was ongoing, the end result um, was that uh, we managed to have 1.4 million validated signatures. This means that the signatures were validated by the member states, and um, the ECI is actually um, the first ECI um, for in terms of the number of countries where the, the minimum was surpassed. And uh, of course, the, the first successful ECI for farmed animals. And it's the sixth uh, ECI, successful ECI, uh, since the launch of the um, ECI uh, regulation um, almost a decade ago. So this is, uh, we are calling uh, over the years, there have been um, uh, quite a few, quite, uh, there has been progress uh, in terms of the, uh, of legislation for animal welfare. Um, we also see progress, not just at EU level, but we also see progress at member state level and in regards to um, cage bans. And uh, we do have uh, a number of, uh, um, member states that have um, either banned or are in the process of banning um, cages. We also see progress actually outside the EU, which is um, a very important factor and uh, does contribute to reduce animal suffering around the world. Um, there are a number of countries that uh, have moved to ban um, cages and uh, more are on the way. 
The legislative ask is uh, basically to, we call on the commission to revise uh, the farming directive 9858, which is, uh, was, uh, took effect in the 1990s. So it's an outdated directive. And uh, we specifically ask uh, for, besides uh, phasing out uh, cages by the year uh, 2027, we ask that uh, and uh, for effective enforcement by the member states um, that imports coming into the EU um, actually um, uh, meet the same standards um, as uh, products um, uh, produced, animal products produced in the EU. And we also ask that uh, producers, in order to help producers uh, transition, we ask that financial assistance is uh, provided to update their systems. We have uh, very positive signs coming from the EU Commission. We have um, um, a, a new commissioner for um, a year and a half now, and uh, we do see that uh, the Commission is willing to actually do a lot for animal welfare and specifically uh, with the commitment to revise uh, animal welfare legislation. Okay, next, yes, here we are. Um, just if you go back a couple of slides. Yes, so we do, we also see movement in the council and we do uh, see member states, for example, the latest one being Czechia um, adopted uh, a, a ban on cages for hens. Uh, next slide. We also have encouraging signs coming from the committee of the regions. Um, the Committee of the Regions adopted uh, an opinion, one opinion on the common agricultural policy and another one on agroecology. And in both uh, opinions, they are asking for a phase out of cage farming. Next. Um, citizens, of course, as we all know, um, uh, are very, very supportive of um, uh, protecting animals in the EU and uh, offering uh, better protection for animals. Uh, in uh, percentages are, are really high up into the 90s. Um, next slide. And um, we also have a lot of support coming from uh, well-known scientists across the world um, uh, calling for an end to cage farming. And um, uh, recently a, a letter was presented and we will have, uh, there will also be an upcoming letter coming from the, the side of businesses. Next slide. And um, as was said earlier, there's a, there's a lot of interest in the European Parliament and uh, many MEPs have joined uh, the Cage Free Working Group. Next slide. And uh, we, uh, the, the MEPs have been involved in a number of actions um, against cages. And of course, this uh, we expect that there will be more involvement uh, in the coming months. Next slide. Uh, we also have um, very supportive reports. Uh, one, a recent one from the European Parliament, another one from the Institute for European Environmental Policy, um, uh, basically uh, saying that there is uh, that uh, cage-free farming is a win-win for all involved including farmers and the animals in our environment. Uh, another report uh, will be coming up uh, towards the end of this year, and uh, it will be on uh, spe specific financial instruments that can be used to uh, support this transition to cage-free farming. Next slide. And uh, the, the move to a cage-free world, of course, goes hand in hand with the Commission's initiatives on the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork. Um, so we will, uh, of course, we support uh, the, the Commission's commitment to revise animal welfare legislation, and uh, we will work with everyone uh, to achieve uh, these goals to improve the lives of animals. Next slide. Um, and this is a great, op the fitness check of uh, uh, the animal welfare legislation is, is a great opportunity for us. 
And uh, we look forward to working, especially with the European Parliament towards that goal. Um, next slide. And uh, the hearing will take place, as was said before, on the 15th of uh, April. And we do expect all of you to uh, be able to join this hearing uh, virtually and to uh, watch the hearing and participate. Um, next slide. Following the hearing, there will be a debate in the plenary. And the, this debate um, um, is uh, quite crucial. So we do ask for uh, support there too. Next slide. And here's an indicative timeline. Uh, there will be, um, uh, of course, uh, um, in uh, April, we have the hearing. And then uh, sometime uh, in June, uh, we will have uh, May or June, we, we expect to have the plenary. And um, at the same time, uh, within three months after the hearing, we expect to have the commission um, decision, the commu commission communication on the Endicage ECI. Next slide. So um, this, is, this is a great challenge because um, uh, we're at a crossroads because in terms of what happened previously with um, ECIs, um, the five previous ECIs, according to the organizers, they were not followed by su substantive legislative uh, reform that they were looking for, that they were asking in those ECIs. So there is an issue here. And the issue is that the EU credibility is at stake. Um, the ECI instrument is at stake because if the European Commission uh, does not respond favorably to the successful ECIs, um, this puts the entire ECI instrument into questions. So this, of course, has uh, ramifications for future citizen involvement and participation in democratic processes. So we have a lot to do. And next slide. And this is the last one. And we do need your support, um, support in regards to the amendments tabled uh, for the farm to fork report. Um, support during the hearing and, uh, and uh, what will follow in terms of the plenary debate. And of course, um, we would uh, very much appreciate um, if uh, um, MEPs reach out to uh, colleagues and um, um, ask for their support to colleagues beyond the animal welfare intergroup. Um, I'm available for questions either now or a bit later. Well, thank you very much, Olga, for your excellent, excellent presentation. presentation. Um, uh, I want to remember, remind MEPs uh, who are attending today, uh, please, please feel free to ask for the floor if you have any questions. And I believe, Reineke, that we already have uh, uh, one intervention. Yes, Anja, indeed. Um, I see that uh, Francesco has raised his hand. So, Francesco, would you like to come in? What did you think of Olga's presentation? Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks for the action that this is that is being made for several years. This is not a, a new action, so this has a lot of work from uh, from 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 also MEPs that worked on on the other mandates. But now uh, that 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 it's con uh, being concrete now with this with this type of of uh, um, proposal so the, the path for me it's clear so we have to push for this um for this debate so the presentation of this year so we can can concretely state the scientific data around this issue and then pressure the political parties so we can have a resolution at plenary and also have a, a strong campaign on social networks and i think we we can do this and uh, we have to have our expectations well uh, moderated but i think we can really gather some support here and also reach out to to other political groups uh, stating obviously that this is the will of, of the citizens and we do really want to to have substantial changes in, in this area and that uh, not only uh, animals will be benefited, but uh, the entire society, because this is a, an evolutionary step. 
and it also goes uh, into the, the the path of several other strategies that are being discussed for example the farm to fork that states that we need to reduce the consumption of animal products and so in that area it's also important for us to 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 end this type of of farming uh, of animals and move towards a more extensive type of production uh, obviously plant-based, but even if it's uh, animal, at least extensive, and it doesn't have this, this type of, of, of cages and, and uh, production system that, that in, in, in several cases is more to export than to, to consume in the European market. So this, this the dif different paradigm that we are um, trying to, to implement is also beneficial to environment. So in that sense, I think this is a very relevant uh, initiative and my my total support for the action that is being made by Leonora, by Anya, by Olga, by Reineke, by Andres, by everyone that, that uh, is working at this level. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca, for your uh, very important uh, support. Indeed, um, phasing out uh, the cages could lead to the systemic change that will not only benefit uh, the animals, but will have a lot of other positive uh, effects too. Um, we have another question uh, for you, Olga. Um, you are saying um, that on the one hand, there's a groundswell of support and also a growing uh, support over the past 12 months. But nevertheless, um, not many of the ECIs have lapsed to concrete change. So how come? Do you, do you have an explanation about that? Why is the Commission not taking these ECIs very seriously? I think um, a lot of times we see that uh, citizens, um, uh, citizens asks are not uh, actually uh, been put in practice and are not turned into laws. Uh, because there are competing interests, uh, interests coming from uh, industry side uh, many times, industry uh, and in, uh, an interest coming from um, um, other sides. Um, so it is, um, so the European Commission um, takes a look at all of those uh, sometimes conflicting interests and um, has to take uh, these into consideration. What we ask is that in this case, as in the case of other successful ECIs, um, we need to, the, the European Commission needs to also take into consideration the fact that um, all European institutions represent EU citizens. And at the end of the day, it is the EU, the views of the EU citizens that should matter and that uh, should take precedence and instead of uh, specific uh, perhaps economic interests of some stakeholders. So it's a complicated, um, certainly it's a complicated issue. I do hope that the European Commission in this case will take note of this um, because uh, we certainly uh, don't want to create um, a system where we have uh, one successful FCI after the other. Um, a lot of effort, as, as you all said, a lot of effort involved in ECIs, in, in putting together and organizing an ECI, and then in the end, uh, uh, nothing happens. Uh, if this happens a few times, and it has already happened uh, before, um, we feel that the NCI instrument uh, will uh, come into question here, and uh, the ECI is a, is a tool for democratic to enhance democratic participation. So we don't want to put democratic participation into question. So um, we hope that um, this, uh, with this ECI, we will have a, a change uh, here and the wheels will turn towards our side. Indeed, indeed. I think this ECI is not only about the animals, but it's also about the credibility of the EU and uh, democracy because um, this ECI was really meant for the citizens to have a voice. Um, so thank you for that, Olga. Um, Anya, I'm looking at the other MEPs in the room. Uh, does anyone uh, would like to come in? Please unmute yourself and, uh, and ask your question or make your intervention. If not, uh, Anya, then I know that you still have a question to Olga. Yes, Reineke, that's correct. I, I have one question. Uh, uh, last year, uh, uh, Olga, we, we organized an event on uh, COVID-19 and 
uh, we invited uh, Dr. Jane Goodall uh, uh, as a keynote speaker there. And she commented there on the uh, COVID pandemic that exploiting animals uh, in the wild, but also exploiting animals in factory farms uh, shows complete disregard uh, towards life and that this has uh, serious consequences for us all. And do you, what are the chances, um, uh, because we know the, the impact of, of uh, uh, biodiversity loss uh, and animals moving, uh, to, uh, going to live closer uh, to, to humans. Um, uh, uh, we know that in factory farms, animals are living in close proximity to each other. Uh, what are the chances uh, that the next pandemic uh, uh, comes from factory farms where animals are kept in cages? Can you tell us something about that? Yes, we fear the, far, the chances are, are great. And um, um, certainly we all, feel, um, we all uh, feel the consequences of what happened um, since uh, a year ago. Um, so uh, in terms of this pandemic, but we fear that this, is, uh, this may not be the only one and we may have more of these in the future. Um, what the way humans have treated um, other animals um, has consequences in the end. Um, the fact that animals are so close to each other and uh, basically they're just stuck one on top of the other in factory farms, um, but also in uh, we know what happens with wildlife trade. Um, these are the perfect, it, it's the, the perfect environment to actually um, um, give the opportunity to pathogens to spread and to spread not just to other animals, but to also spread to humans. Um, and we feel the consequences of, uh, of, of these actions uh, in terms of the wildlife trade um, uh, now. And uh, we, we fear that there is going to be, uh, we will have more uh, pandemics in the future. It, these are in a way here to stay. And so therefore we as humans, we need to change our ways and we need to change our practices. And we need to also show respect to other creatures, um, other beings that inhabit this planet with us, um, uh, taking advantage of nature and taking advantage of the environment and other animals uh, will come back to haunt us. Um, we had a taste of this with this uh, with COVID-19, and uh, this may not be the end. We may see more, much more of this unless uh, we change uh, the way we treat other animals. And we also look at our food system. Um, certainly in, in this case, uh, we are talking about um, cages is part of, of a, a, a much bigger um, systemic um, change that needs to happen. And, um, um, and this includes uh, uh, a move away from uh, eating too many animal products, uh, a move to more, um, to, to actually having, enriching our diets with plant-rich uh, foods. And, um, and of course, uh, giving animals a better life and a life worth living. Uh, factory farming is certainly should not um, does not have a place in 21st century Europe. Thank you, Olga, and I totally agree with you. Um, uh, the next uh, speaker uh, I would like to introduce now is uh, Katrin Yadav. Uh, Katrin is the research manager at Compassion in World Farming International, and she will present uh, to us the, the current problems and alternatives to animal farm, uh, farming and cages. Uh, Catherine, uh, uh, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'll just share my screen.
So are you seeing the full screen or the one with the um, uh, Not the full screen. So. Okay, let me swap. Is that better? Yes, very good. Okay, perfect. Uh, so yes, I'll just talk briefly about um, the science on animal welfare and cages and what alternative systems are available. And just because we don't have very long, I'll cover hens, um, rabbits and sows, which are three of the, the most caged animals in the EU. Um, so because animals are sentient, we have the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU, which requires that um, we pay full regard to their welfare requirements when, when um, formulating policy. And in addition to this, 9858 stipulates that their freedom of movement must not be restricted to cause unnecessary suffering. And that when an animal is confined, they must have the space required according to their physiological and their behavioral needs in accordance with science. So what do we know in terms of science? Well, um, for hens, we certainly know that they have a very strong internal motivation to perch up high, to forage, and um, to dust bathe, which is a behavior that keeps their feathers in good condition. And science has shown us that the ability for hens to perform these behaviors is essential just for basic welfare. Um, it's not essential just because of the function that the behaviors provide, but because hens are so strongly internally motivated to carry out these natural behaviors, just performing the behaviors in their own right is essential for, for hens to have basic welfare. And science shows us that when hens can't perform these behaviors, they suffer from stress and um, that can lead to feather pecking. And uh, this is why most of the laying hens are beak trimmed um, and can lead to poor health and welfare in a, in a number of ways. Um, and in the EU, we have just under half of the laying hens are in the enriched cage. Um, this is a, a short video just showing the enriched cage. So it, it's quite clear that in enriched cages, hens are deprived of their most basic needs, even for freedom of movement um, in terms of walking or running or stretching their wings out fully, um, but let alone deprived also of their strong instincts to perch up high so they feel safe, um, to forage and to dust bathe, for example. And we know that these systems from science, from behavioral studies and from physiological studies. Um, we know that they cause the hens a great deal of stress. But um, now in the EU, we actually have just over half of our hens in cage-free systems. Um, and they're in systems like this, in barn systems where they can move around, um, they can stretch their wings fully, run around, they can forage, dust bathe and perch. And some are in free range systems or organic systems where they can go outside and perform natural behaviors. And in terms of rabbits, um, you know, rabbits are very athletic animals. They've got those powerful back legs, which they've evolved for jumping, um, running really fast and for digging those complex burrows. And they spend around 30 to 70% of their time foraging, looking for food. This is some footage um, of how almost all rabbits are kept in the EU. Um, this is standard rabbit uh, cages um, taken in Italy, Spain, France, Greece and Czech.
Um, and rabbits, they're kept in these cages for their whole lives. Um, I mean, we can see that this is no life for any animal and it clearly prevents almost all of their natural behaviors. And in addition to that, um, industrial intensive rabbit farming is one of the highest users of antibiotic um, in, of any food producing animal, despite the fact that it's really the f intensive farming of rabbits is limited to just a few countries in the EU. And in spite of that high antibiotic use, they still have um, a very high disease and mortality rate. So it's no surprise really that the European Parliament adopted um, this resolution back in 2017, which outlined that there are grave concerns regarding the poor welfare and the high stress and mortality and morbidity levels in farmed rabbits in Europe, and that barren battery cages are an inappropriate housing system for rabbits. And then just last year, EFSA published another scientific opinion which concluded that those conventional cages, which we've seen cause the worst welfare out of any um, husbandry system, out of any housing system, they cause the worst welfare for both the breeding females and the growing rabbits. And, you know, quite logically, the report found that the restriction of movement in those systems can't be solved without significantly changing the system and moving away from those cages. And the report also found that welfare in organic systems is, is generally good. Um, and, you know, happily, we do have a, quite a range of commercially operating cage free systems across different countries in the EU now. So we have pens and parks like these where rabbits, they're able to stretch out, they're able to hop, um, they can stand up straight and they've got places to hide. And here are a few more examples. Um, Belgium, which farms around 3 million rabbits every year, they banned cages back in 2016. And, and their growing rabbits are now um, almost all in, in park systems. And then finally, uh, with regards to sows, like hens and like rabbits, um, pigs retain most of their um, behaviors of their wild ancestors. So, for example, a sow prior to giving birth, she's very strongly motivated to, to build a nest. Given the opportunity, a, a sow would walk around up to 10 kilometres looking for a suitable site. And then she'd spend many hours constructing quite an elaborate nest, which she would then go into to give birth. And that behaviour, science has shown, is so strongly internally motivated from those maternal hormones that prepare her. Um, for giving birth, that sows need to go through the motions of, of preparing a nest, whether or not they have the materials to do so, and whether or not they actually need to prepare a nest. So even if they're provided with, um, with one, they just have this overwhelming motivation to do so, and their welfare is really impaired if they can't do that. Um, but in, in modern intensive pig farming, Sows are practically immobilized for weeks on end around every pregnancy in farrowing crates, which, which is uh, what these are. And the degree of restriction in a farrowing crate and in a sow stall or a gestation stall um, is more severe actually than for any other animal in any form of um, European livestock farming. So we're talking about um, a cage that's about 15 centimetres bigger than the actual width of the animal herself when she's standing up. And often it's the same length as her from nose to tail. So understandably sows, they have great difficulty even standing up and lying down in these cages because their movement is so restricted. And there's a, a large, a very large um, volume of scientific evidence that sow welfare, but also piglet welfare is, um, severely compromised in farrowing crates and in sow stalls. And back in 2007, EFSA recognised that um, frustration and stress are a major welfare risk in these systems because of the severe restriction of movement and their prevention of natural behaviours. And with regards to piglet mortality, which is um, 
the reason really why the farrowing crate was introduced um, a few decades ago. Um, and that's because crushing of piglets can be higher in loose farrowing systems. Um, but EFSA, even 14 years ago, the, the studies showed that the total mortality, so death of piglets from all, all causes, not just crushing, um, is usually the same in free farrowing systems, or it can be even lower than in crates. And we do indeed have a really wide range now of free farrowing systems. So we've got the traditional free range or organic systems in like the top left hand picture. Um, but all the other pictures are just a small example of what's called free farrowing pens. Um, and loads of these have been developed in, in Europe in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and these keep the cells and the piglets indoors, but they incorporate structures to um, protect the piglets and reduce crushing. And what research has shown and experience is that in these designed pens, um, the piglet mortality from all causes is um, if they're well designed and they're well managed, it's lower. So this is a particular study back in 2000, um, 2012, which looked at um, 12 different designed pens for cells indoors, uh, looked at all the research available and it compared them with outdoor systems and with conventional farrowing crates. And it found that the designed pens actually on average had the lowest total piglet mortality and in Switzerland, where farrowing crates were banned um, since 1997, um, and the um, free farrowing pens have been used exclusively since 2007, um, piglet losses have not increased there, even though the sows are all free and their litter sizes have increased, which is a greater, a greater risk for, for um, more piglet crushing. And um, we have recently published a lengthy report on the science behind cages and what the alternatives are for, um, for all species. So hens, sows, rabbits, ducks, geese, calves and quail. It'll be on our website very soon, um, but in the meantime, you can access it using that, that link there at the top of the slide. And you can download it from there. And so, in summary, the welfare problems caused by cages, they're very well documented in the scientific research now, and alternatives do exist. And actually, you know, alternatives are in use commercially and the demand for these kinds of uh, cage-free systems is growing. And because these viable um, cage-free systems exist, then the suffering that's caused by cages that we've seen is unnecessary. Um, and it's certainly not in accordance with established science. So that's why it's appropriate and it's a timely um, moment now for legislation to be updated um, to reflect the knowledge and also to reflect societal expectations of how we farm animals. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Catherine, for touching up uh, upon this important issue and for proposing solutions as well. Uh, before we go to the other MEPs, I, I would like to start with a, a question to you myself. Um, uh, it is about um, what we hear from farmers. Uh, uh, you showed, for instance, images of rabbits farmed in, in conventional cages and in the Netherlands and Belgium. The uh, farmers promote these uh, uh, park system uh, with uh, bigger cages from different materials. Do you think any cage can be enlarged to a level uh, uh, where animals can show natural behavior? Or is it just impossible as we also see with the enriched cages for laying hands? And, and if the EU would improve cages or uh, uh, modernize them and enlarge them. How long will this delay a uh, cage-free future? Um, that's, that's a really interesting point. The, I mean, the definition of a cage can, can become a little bit blurred and 
certainly with laying hens, the enriched cage hasn't had a very long um, a long ac life of acceptability among citizens. In fact, you know, I don't think citizens would ever have accepted it if they if they'd known about it at the time. Um, and yes, in terms of what citizens accept and in terms of the science about animals being able to perform their natural behaviours, the system has to be fit for purpose and it has to be able to allow those natural behaviours. So going to, for example, an enriched cage for rabbits, as the EFSA report last year pointed out, you simply can't get over the, the main problems of conventional cages, which is restriction of movement, unless you have a significant change of the system. So by enriching the cage, um, that doesn't get over the restriction of movement. And that's one of the main welfare issues. So no, I think um, it's quite clear that simply improving cages and enriching them would be a waste of um, effort and a waste of expenses and it, it wouldn't have a good return for the industry. It needs to be a system that's, um, that's going to be fit for future and that can be indeed called cage free. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe Olga, uh, do you have any um, ideas on this uh, question as well? Or uh, shall we just move to Reineke for uh, questions from other MEPs? I don't hear Olga, so let's move on to uh, Reineke. Uh, do you have other questions? Yes, um, I just oh. wanted to add here that um, um, back in the 90s, when um, the move towards and uh, from uh, barren battery cages to enriched was actually decided and put into law, um, first of all, uh, citizen awareness about the cages wasn't as high as it is now. So we are uh, 25 years later. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, a lot has happened in 25 years. We have a new generation. Um, and um, uh, back then, although it was an improvement, it was uh, seen as um, a small um, level of progress. Um, it still, um, it was not a big, it was not a win. It was not, um, it did not really do so much for the animals as we see in the end. So now that we're wiser, older and wiser, uh, 25 years later, uh, we say that we're not going to accept anything else but a cage-free future. We're not going to accept uh, enriched cages or any other of any other cage system where animals are restricted in their movement. And uh, we are going uh, for a cage-free uh, all the way. Uh, nothing in the middle will do so. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Reineke, over to you. Thank you, Anja. And yes, um, we don't have any questions from uh, Ami Pete at this moment. So please, if you would like to come in, uh, raise your hand or uh, pop a message in the, in the chat box. Um, we do have a comment uh, from uh, MEP uh, Shoy Drova uh, that unfortunately she couldn't uh, attend, but she's very supportive of the initiative and she would also like to hear more about how the ECI could be linked to the implementation report uh, on animal welfare. And this is an, a question uh, to you, Anya, and we can come back to this after the meeting. Um, there is a question from the audience to Catherine. Um, Catherine, um, some farmers are saying that there are also many issues with regards to cage-free farming. So how do you look at that and how can we tackle those issues? Yes, uh, yes, they're, they're certainly, you know, for some farmers, the idea of going cage-free is quite daunting because it's not something that they've been used to. And that's why it's so important that we, um, you know, that schemes are set up to share um, best practice. And, you know, the, the briefing that we've put together shows what the alternatives are. Um, there are so many alternatives available now. And uh, the experience of, of more and more farmers in using them is growing. And generally, we find with all of these systems that as farmers gain experience, results improve and improve. And so 
um, that's why we've put together this, you know, this um, major review showing what what um, what the issues are, how they're overcome, and and what the alternatives are. And there's an awful lot of resources out there. So for, even for pigs, for example, there's an entire um, website of free farrowing systems from across the EU, and farmers can go on there and get support and learn about what kind of systems are there. They can even cost them, find out how much it would cost for their farm to trans transfer over and get um, share experience with other farmers. So it's really about sharing the knowledge. The knowledge is there and um, it's, yeah, it's about sharing it and, and helping farmers make that move. I think a lot of farmers want to make the transition, but they're nervous, so they need that support. Yes, absolutely. And talking about support, uh, we also have uh, quite large uh, subsidies in place in the EU uh, to support farmers in uh, making this uh, transition. Uh, a related question to this is, and I'm not sure if you, Catherine or Orwell, can respond to this, is that um, some are arguing that our producers will go to third countries and will just set up their business there, uh, and then the EU will import uh, low welfare uh, produce. How do you look uh, at that? And how can we uh, avoid that this will happen indeed? Olga, you would like to come in on that? Yes, for sure. Well, we are calling for actually a change in a paradigm here. Um, we, we cannot go for, for many reasons, as we said before, including the pandemic. We need to change, completely change the way we farm and also the, 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 the food that is produced. We need food that is healthy for citizens that also does not, uh, that, uh, does not damage the environment. And, uh, and when animals are used for food, we need to give them here in the EU, the region in the world with the highest animal welfare standards, we need to give animals a life worth living. Um, so um, this model, old model, of um, that brought us into this difficult situation we're in today, uh, where we keep producing, producing, and when consumption is not that high in Europe, we turn our eyes towards other countries, third countries outside the EU, and we uh, give, we sell our products there. This is no longer working. Um, therefore, uh, we are calling um, with. Of course, uh, starting with, uh, of course, uh, uh, a cage-free future, we also incorporate in this many other messages that have to do with um, the, the kind of future we, we want to have for our citizens, um, the a future that is um, where uh, we minimize animal suffering as much as possible. We also wear a, a kind of future where uh, we give to our citizens healthy food. Um, and uh, we, we move away from this whole intensive industrial production um, where we um, utilize um, in a bad way, we utilize our um, uh, environment uh, in a very bad way. We destroy our environment to just keep this ongoing uh, system running for a bit longer. And I think we need to move away from this approach. Um, and uh, uh, the ECI is also part of this, uh, of this uh, new paradigm that we, we seek. And um, uh, we hope that, uh, that we will stop looking at ways to um, uh, make animals suffer for as long as possible. Um, by uh, if, if this cannot happen in the EU, then we look to third countries. This, this needs to stop. Um, I, I think um, this is it. <laughs> Thank you, Olga. And clearly, we could also protect our producers by making sure that imports will comply with our standards. Huh? Um, yes. And that will then also have a positive effect uh, on um, the business uh, of producers uh, elsewhere. Um, so I see a, a lot of hands being raised now, Anja. Um, so um, could I ask uh, Petra Zasrevitius to come in first? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning to everybody. <clears throat> well, I, I have two uh, interlinked uh, questions uh, uh, on, on, on this issue. Um, 
you know, I'm a strong believer in um, public awareness uh, and public uh, campaigning um, and very targeted campa uh, campaigning on uh, uh, animal welfare. Uh, what comes, I mean, on different aspects, uh, uh, cage-free uh, issue among of them. Um, since um, I think uh, two years ago, I mean, uh, uh, live fish is not anymore available in supermarkets in Lithuania. And it happened because of the uh, pressures from, um, you know, uh, organizations uh, uh, campaigning against that, which is absolutely normal and understandable. To what extent your uh, or, um, institution is engaged with the uh, farmers uh, associations and organizations in the European Union in order to have um, a very to the point uh, debate and discussion on all aspects, economic, environmental, uh, animal welfare, all together, in order to convince them and to have them as a partner in this regard, not just a opposing uh, part uh, um, as such. And secondly, um, uh, can you quote any um, successful uh, national, regional, uh, territorial-based uh, uh, public um, campaigning um, Mm, uh, example in order to sp spread it over the Europe uh, and even more, I mean, uh, beyond our borders. I think we should uh, approach our neighbors, I mean, uh, instantly with no, uh, with no any uh, restrictions. Uh, and, and this uh, kind of line of neighbors is quite a, a long one. Uh, in order to have uh, this public campaigning uh, as successful as possible, because it changes the mindset of people, uh, I mean, not just consumers, but as well as producers uh, to uh, to large extent. Um, uh, I call it, I mean, a theory of drop by drop. I mean, it really makes uh, in a final end a huge influence and probably in a best kind of uh, citizens uh, um, based uh, approach. I mean, can you, can you, can you, can you uh, recall any uh, successful um, ongoing or uh, previous uh, public campaigning uh, example. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Petras. Uh, I'm looking at you again, uh, Olga. Uh, would you have something to, to say uh, to this? I think the ECI in itself was already a big campaign, right? Yes. Yes, and um, uh, joining those two questions together, yes, uh, we have reached out in order to find support for the ECI. We reached out to many organizations as well as citizens, and we do have among the 170 uh, organizations, uh, over 170 organizations and federations that have supported the ECI. We also have farmers um, uh, there, and we do have, uh, besides animal welfare groups, we do have um, organic uh, support from, from people involved in the organic movement. We have environmental organizations that have uh, that are supporting the ECI. Um, we are also, um, so, so we do have, in a way, we have uh, broadened um, the, the, um, uh, the scope and, and have, in a way, brought in um, many people coming from different sectors. Um, we are always uh, thinking of the farmers. We are always thinking of what, how the farmers can can improve the welfare of animals um, uh, and also how we can help farmers to do this. Um, in addition, um, we have reached out to, we not, and, uh, not just our organization, but together with many other organizations, we have reached out beyond Europe. And um, besides uh, gaining the support of citizens in Europe, uh, we have joined together forces uh, in the um, animal, in the global animal advocacy world, um, where um, uh, many of us now are part of a, a larger, a universal movement, I would say, to improve the lives of animals, uh, to make sure that uh, there is legal protection for animals worldwide. And uh, we will continue to do that. Just recently, another big federation, Animal Welfare Federation, uh, a global one was formed. So as, uh, as we all know, the uh, citizens in Europe, but also 
um, worldwide are, are concerned about animals and we have seen this over the years and certainly within the last decade. Thank you, Olga, uh, and, and, and that's right. Uh, and coming back to what you said, uh, Petros, the EU could also play a very active role in promoting cage free farming through the trade uh, agreements and uh, everything that is happening uh, in terms of foreign affairs. So um, very good points to promote the scientific report across the EU's borders. Um, I would like to invite uh, Tilly Matz uh, to come in. Morning, Tilly. Good morning, Reinike. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy to be with you. And thank you for this excellent presentation. It makes me always so angry and sad. And um, yeah, when I see those pictures of how the reality is for pigs, for rabbits and so on. And coming back on how we could continue um, putting pressure, um, I think there are still uh, some fights that we really need to have. And I remember the agricultural minister of Germany, Frau Klöckner, speaking about the labeling of animal welfare. Uh, I think it's more than ever important that we don't speak about animal welfare labeling, which might then mean, as you said, exactly five centimeters more in a cage that a pig has. And, and there I, com I completely agree with Olga, we should have a very clear language. There are no cages at all and that the label can only reflect the how the, the the animals are treated how they were growing up how they really their natural um needs were respecting while growing up so it's not an animal welfare label but uh, how the 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 animal was raised up i don't find the right no, word now in english sorry for sorry for that and then on the other side yeah are there enough incentives for the farmers uh when we see that there is no real dedicated budget in the in the cap uh, politics right now um, we have the animal welfare eco schemes uh, they are still being discussed so it's important to go on and put pressure there on the trilogue also uh, as they are still going on to to be discussed and then in the pillar two of the cap there is a, a very very low percentage i and I, I think uh, christine is also listening she she probably knows the exact percentage i think it's a uh, one or two percent so it's really ridiculous and 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 so i think it's also we have to um, make something there so in order that we have more concrete incentives for the farmers for real animal welfare and not animal welfare washing uh, and and so i think something we have to campaign about it's also uh, fighting against uh, fake news i talk now about um, the labeling which can be uh, animal welfare washing when we talk of a label we have to be very careful and also the very clear message for me today is uh, the fake news about enriched cages. We saw, thank you, Catherine, for that, what it meant, what it means really enriched cages. They are not enriched at all and they don't respect animal welfare at all. So I think we have to put pressure on the onset, still on the ongoing negotiations, but also keep really the, the, the consumers informed by uh, a right labeling. That is something we have to tackle. I'm looking at Anya, of course, in the farm to fork strategy, even if it's only a strategy and, and not yet a legislative tax, um, speaking about labeling, putting uh, the pressure because the citizens, if they see those pictures, they really don't want that. We know that all around the, uh, in the room here. So go fighting fake news, putting pressure. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, because I'm going to be so angry and so impatient, how we can um, put more pressure and have in order to have more concrete results uh, soon. I, I think it would be in my eyes so easy when we see the images of the of the rabbits especially to go there for at least that they can stand up that they can jump that they can move uh, so why don't we go concrete steps because most of the citizens and you know that outside in the eu are waiting for that so and they're putting pressure also for showing the truth and fighting fake news Voila. Thank you very much for listening to me and, and I hope we, we're going to succeed by concrete measures pretty soon. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Teddy, for your, uh, as ever, passionate uh, speech. We need your full support. Uh, and in that respect, Olga, I think that a lot is coming together here. Eh? We have the ECI, we have the forthcoming revision of the legislation, we have a new cap uh, coming in. So, yes, it will still take some time, but uh, change can be on the horizon, right? Yes, exactly. So, um, it's an exciting time, actually. Uh, we know that uh, there will be a lot of obstacles ahead of us, but it is exciting. We have a new cap, although we would have uh, certainly liked uh, a stronger cap for animal welfare and actually not a, a, a common agriculture policy, but a food policy across Europe. Um, uh, the whatever measures are there are uh, for animal welfare are on a voluntary basis. This is actually uh, something that concerns us a lot. Member states are not obliged. It's not uh, a mandatory uh, provision uh, for animal welfare, and this concerns citizens a lot. Um, we do have, of course, uh, now the green, uh, the European Green Deal, and the Farm to Fork strategy. And uh, it's, uh, it's time that uh, we put as much pressure as possible um, so that in the end, uh, the, the, the strategy and the goals of the strategy also translate into improving the lives of animals. And of course, uh, making sure that citizens' concerns are, um, are noted. Um, and, um, um, and we do have, uh, of course, a review of the animal welfare legislation. And uh, we have high hopes for this because it is time that uh, we have, as, uh, as MEP Tilly Metz said, um, we have concrete um, measures uh, to, to achieve the high animal welfare standards that Europe is claiming to have. Um, the, uh, already uh, many of the existing uh, legislation and the uh, directives and regulations on animal welfare are uh, quite outdated and they're not based on the latest scientific science they're based on old science from the for example directive 9858 which is the general uh, farming directive it uh, it's based on science from the early 90s um, that's uh, that's nearly 30 years ago so it is time that um, um, we we take a, a step forward and uh, we feel that uh, uh, we strongly feel that the, this commission, um, with the help of the parliament, of course, and the council, uh, will take that uh, much needed step forward. Uh, thank you, uh, Olga. All eyes are on uh, the commission. Um, uh, Anya, we have a, a final intervention from uh, Manuela Riva. Manuela, would you like to come in, please? Yes, thank you very much and very shortly because I know that time is running, um, but I want to, un, um, I can underline everything what Tilly said and I can only agree um, on what she said that um, for me, there is no animal welfare label because we as humans, we don't even know what animal welfare is. So I think it's a completely greenwashing of uh, what this politic is trying to do at the moment. And uh, the momentum is there, people want to be informed and, and that's why I'm absolutely um, convinced um, of the informed consumer. We need a label where exactly these cages, where exactly these uh, animals are shown, how they are kept, that they can't stand up. We need this on the meat package. And I'm fully sure that people would stop buying these products because they're informed. At the moment, we have numbers, one to four. People don't know what it is. They think one is good, so they buy it. But if we have a picture where people can see exactly how an animal is kept, like we have in cigarettes, then this will work because pictures work. But I wanted to bring in another point here. Um, there's a current discussion at the moment in Germany about this animal welfare label. We already talked about Madame Klöckner, which is really a horrible minister. Sorry that I have to say so, but um, she's talking now about an animal welfare labeling. She's seeing that people want um, animals not to be in cages. So she brings up this discussion about having more space for the animals, having more light for the animals, having more um, toys to play. But she does this in a very, I think, wrong way. And this is maybe uh, I want to hear about what Olga says about this, because she's, she is saying we need to make um, 
meat more expensive? Yes, of course, meat has to be more expensive, but I don't know if 40 cents really is helping very much. And now she puts the discussion um, like this new financial models are extremely complicated. We don't know exactly how to put it, but I think it's very wrong sided just to go to the way of making meat more cheap and nothing uh, more expensive and nothing else because we know how people react. So we need a much broader support and effort here of politicians and citizens. The money is there. The money in the cup is there to help animals not being too much caged. And um, um, we also have um, uh, national subsidies which can help. So I don't think that we need now this discussion of making uh, cheap more expensive and that's it and uh, to put everything on the consumer in a wrong way. But we also need uh, governments to make much more and to invest the money uh, the right way, the money also coming from the EU for more animal welfare standards. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Manuela. Um, Olga, do you have a, a short answer to this? How could um, increasing the price of meat and, and labeling help also to phase out the cages? Yes, uh, we are certainly not in favor of a so-called animal welfare label because it will be a fake label. It will give a fake impression uh, to consumers uh, when they actually know very little about the way animals are raised and the way animals are farmed. Um, uh, a label that will uh, specifically refer to the method of production, to how animals are raised, is the right label. And this is what uh, we and uh, many, many organizations together are calling for. So not uh, animal welfare, because what does animal welfare mean for the consumer? I mean, who knows? I'd say it's not, uh, it's not possible. Um, in terms of uh, increasing the price of meat um, and uh, leaving out uh, all other considerations about changing the system, about changing our consumption patterns, and looking at our consumption, of very high consumption of animal products in Europe is, is the wrong way to go about this. Um, it's, um, it's a very... Uh, it, it's an effort to fix something that is totally wrong, that needs to be turned upside down. So it, uh, we would uh, support certainly uh, looking at um, existing production and consumption patterns, uh, looking at the production system and making um, real radical change in the production system to improve the lives of animals and to produce healthy um, food. Um, that has lower um, environmental uh, consequences and uh, is, is good for, for everyone and for the planet. Um, and at the same time, also looking at our consumption and uh, you know, trying to increase the, the uh, address, the need to, uh, to decrease the consumption of animal products and increase the consumption of healthy plant-based foods. I have to say just one, uh, one final comment um, that besides the, the over 300 uh, million animals who are farmed in cages every year. So imagine your entire life basically spent in a cage or close to your entire life. Imagine how, to how intolerable this must be and, and the degree of suffering involved in this. Um, we need to look at the big picture. And we need to look at the close to 9 billion farmed animals. Uh, I'm not even counting the farmed fish here um, who are um, uh, killed for food in the EU every year. This is, um, uh, this is a, um, a number that is beyond our imagination. So um, if we are talking about high animal welfare standards and, and animal protection in Europe and the, the level of protection in Europe is much better than any, anywhere else, we need to also look at um, the numbers of animals uh, we use for food every year. This needs to be uh, significantly decreased. And at the same time, we need to look at the health of the citizens and, um, and, and of course the health of the planet and look more towards the need to um, enrich our diets uh, and our food with uh, healthy uh, plant-rich uh, ingredients and, and plant-rich food. 
I could say more, but uh, I know we don't I'm have sure, time. I'm sure. Uh, uh, thanks so much, uh, Olga, for um, uh, your very uh, clear answers, uh, very convincing answers. And yeah, I, I'm afraid we are running out of time. I see Eleonora would also like to come in briefly, but I leave it up to you uh, if we can run over a bit. Well, uh, uh, I have not a problem with running over a little bit. Uh, I have a question to answer myself, but uh, Eleonora, very brief, please. Yeah, my, my intention was to intervene just to say that I really believe, I completely share and, and support what Olga was saying. And I really believe that it's really time to get targets, uh, reduction targets on production and consumption. Europe works with targets. We have targets on uh, climate policies. We have targets on pesticides, for example. We are working and introducing them. I really believe it's time to be brave and courageous and uh, introduce targets also on uh, reduction and production of meat. and animal products. So that was my comment. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Eleonora. Um, I, uh, I totally agree with, with you. Uh, I have one question to answer myself from uh, Miss uh, Soydrova. Uh, she is not at the meeting, but she has a question about the, the farm to fork uh, uh, report. Uh, and for me as being the uh, rapporteur in Envy, and she asked about the process and, and what we can do for the NKHH citizens initiative. Uh, I just can say we, we got uh, almost 2300 amendments on this report. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done. There are also several amendments on the citizens initiative and the cage age. So to all of you, please um, contact your shadow rapporteurs in the envy committee and in the agri committee uh, to make sure that the cage age uh, uh, citizens initiative ends up in the compromise amendments uh, so that we can vote on the 3rd of June in the combined envy and agri committee meeting and in July in plenary. Um, so we are uh, absolutely running out of time. So I would like to conclude this meeting by saying that with 1.4 million citizens, 170 organizations and over 140 scientists calling on the EU to ban cage, uh, caging uh, uh, animals in farms, uh, the European Commission will find it difficult to ignore this issue. We as MEPs need to continue putting pressure on the Commission to encourage it uh, to make the right choice and uh, to create a better future for farmed animals. A future where the cage will only be found in museums. Uh, thank you all panelists for taking the time to be uh, with us today and for your excellent contributions. And thank you all participants for attending and asking questions. I hope to see you at our next intergroup meeting on the 18th of March at 10 o'clock. Uh, but I also hope that you can join us, uh, join our event um, uh, that we will organize next Monday on the 8th of March at 2 o'clock on the suspension of the import of cruelly produced horse meat from overseas. Um, that's all. I wish you all a nice day and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.